What's up, everybody? Welcome back to A People's Historian, the show where we read about half an hour of history together. My name is Jason Kishneff, and we are reading War is a Racket by Brigadier General Smedley D. Butler. Um, really important information for everybody to know. Um, it'd be nice if you shared this episode with people you know so that they can learn this stuff because I mean it's so relevant today we know that we have been fighting wars in, for oil in Iraq and Afghanistan for 16, 17, 18 years um, and other places and, and we you know we know that it's about oil but the you know the actual facts you know, aside from, you know, the inkling that we all kind of have an inkling that it's about oil, the actual facts, you don't really hear the actual facts in the mainstream narrative. You don't hear that Genie Energy, which is getting oil contracts in Syria and Israel, has a Rothschilds on its um, advisory board and Dick Cheney and um, um, Dick Richardson former Clinton cabinet member, Secretary of Energy, and uh, Governor of New Mexico for a while. You don't hear about the involvement. You know, we know that we were involved in destabilizing Central America and Guatemala, but we don't hear about, you know, what a United, the specifics about United Fruit Company. Um, and we, we know that, you know, Venezuela, what's going on in Venezuela seems awfully shady. But we don't hear about the facts about um, the the vice president straight or no, one of the secretary members actually said that um, you know it would be great for American oil companies to get their fingers in Venezuela. They realized that oh he he spoke too soon he shouldn't have said that and they they pretty much don't don't play that. The videos are out there, but you have to go looking for it. And if you tell people this stuff, you look like you're insane. But it's not insane. War is a Racket by Smedley, General Smedley Butler. Chapter 1. War is a Racket. It always has been. It is possibly the oldest, easily the most profitable, Surely the most vicious. It is the only one international in scope. It is the only one in which the profits are reckoned in dollars and the losses in lives. A racket is best described, I believe, as something that is not what it seems to the majority of people. Only a small inside group knows what it is about. It is conducted for the benefit of the very few at the expense of the very many. Out of war, a few people make huge fortunes. In the World War, World War I, a mere handful garnered the profits of the conflict. At least 21,000 new millionaires and billionaires were made in the United States during the World War. That many admitted their huge blood gains in their income tax returns. How many other war millionaires falsified their income tax returns, no one knows. How many of those war millionaires shouldered a rifle? How many of them dug a trench? How many of them knew what it meant to go hungry in a rat-infested dugout? How many of them spent sleepless frightened knights, ducking shells and shrapnel and machine gun bullets. How many of them parried the bayonet thrust of an enemy? How many of them were wounded or killed in battle? Out of war, nations acquire additional territory if they are victorious. They just take it. This newly acquired territory promptly is exploited by the few, the self-same few who wrung dollars out of blood in the war. The general public shoulders the bill. 
And what is this bill? This bill renders a horrible accounting. Newly placed gravestones, mangled bodies, shattered minds, broken hearts and homes, economic instability, depression, and all its attendant miseries, back-breaking taxation for generations and generations. For a great many years as a soldier, I had a suspicion that war was a racket. Not until I retired to civil life did I fully realize it. Now that I see the international war clouds again gathering as they are today, I must face it and speak out. Again they are choosing sides. France and Russia met and agreed to stand side by side. Italy and Austria hurried to make a similar agreement. Poland and Germany cast sheep's eyes at each other, forgetting for the nonce their dispute over the Polish corridor. The assassination of King Alexander of Yugoslavia complicated matters. Yugoslavia and Hungary, long bitter enemies, were almost at each other's throats. Italy was ready to jump in, but France was waiting. So was Czechoslovakia. All of them are looking ahead to war. Not the people. Not those who fight and pay and die. Only those who foment wars and remain safely at home to profit. There are 40 million men under arms in the world today and our statesmen and diplomats have the temerity to say that war is not in the making. Hell's bells! Are these 40 million men being trained to be dancers? Not in Italy, to be sure. Premier Mussolini knows what they are being trained for. He at least is frank enough to speak out. Only the other day, Il Duce and International Conciliation, the publication of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, said, And above all fascism, the more it considers and observes the future and the development of humanity quite apart from political considerations of the moment, believes neither in the possibility for the utility of perpetual peace. War alone brings up to its highest tension all human energy and puts the stamp of nobility upon the peoples who have the courage to meet it. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, Mussolini means exactly what he says. His well-trained army, his great fleet of planes, and even his navy are ready for war. Anxious for it, apparently. His recent stand at the side of Hungary in the latter's dispute with Yugoslavia showed that, and the hurried mobilization of his troops on the Austrian border after the assassination of Dolfus showed it too. There are others in Europe, too, whose saber-rattling presages war. Sooner or later, Herr Hitler, with his rearming Germany and his constant demands for more and more arms is an equal if not a greater menace to peace. France only recently increased the term of military service for its youth from a year to 18 months. <coughs> yes, all over, nations are camping on their arms. The mad dogs of Europe are on the loose. In the Orient, the maneuvering is more adroit. Back in 1904, when Russia and Japan fought, we kicked out our old friends, the Russians, and back Japan. Then our various, very generous international bankers were financing Japan. Now the trend is to poison us against the Japanese. What does the open door policy in China mean to us? Our trade with China is about $90 million a year or the Philippine Islands. We have spent about $600 million in the Philippines in 35 years, and we, our bankers and industrialists and speculators, 
have private investments there of less than $200,000. Then to save that China trade of about $90 million or to protect these private investments of less than $200 million in the Philippines, we would be all stirred up to hate Japan and go to war. A war that might well cost us tens of billions of dollars. And tens of billions of dollars was a lot more then than it is now. Hundreds of thousands of lives of Americans and many more hundreds of thousands of physically maimed and mentally unbalanced men. Of course, for this loss, there would be a compensating profit. Fortunes would be made. Millions and billions of dollars would be piled up by a few. Munitions makers, shipbuilders, manufacturers, meat packers, speculators, they would fare well. Yes, they are getting ready for another war. Why shouldn't they? It pays high dividends, but what does it profit the masses? What does it profit the men who were killed? What does it profit the men who were maimed? What does it profit their mothers and sisters, their wives and their sweethearts? What does it profit their children? What does it profit anyone except the very few to whom war means huge profits? Yes, and what does it profit the nation? Take our own case. Until 1898, we didn't own a bit of territory outside the mainland of North America. At that time, our national debt was a little more than $1 billion. Billion with a B. Then we became internationally minded. We forgot or shunted aside the advice of the father of our country. We forgot Washington's warning about entangling alliances. We went to war. We acquired outside territory. At the end of the World War period, as a direct result of our fiddling in international affairs, our national debt had jumped to over $25 billion. Therefore, on a purely financial bookkeeping basis, we ran a little behind year for year, and that foreign trade might well have been ours without the wars. It would have been far cheaper, not to say safer, for the average American who pays the bills to stay out of foreign entanglements. For a very few, this racket, like bootlegging and other underworld rackets, brings fancy profits but the cost of operations is always transferred to the people who do not profit. Chapter 2 Who makes the profits? The World War, rather our brief participation in it, has caused the United States some $52 billion. Figure it out. That means $400 to every American man, woman, and child. And we haven't paid the debt yet. We are paying it. Our children will pay it. And our children's children probably still will be paying the cost of that war. The normal profits of a business concern in the United States are 6, 8, 10, and sometimes even 12%. But wartime profits, ah, that is another matter. 20, 60, 100, 300, and even 1,800 percent. The sky's the limit. All that the traffic will bear. Uncle Sam has the money. Let's get it. Of course, it isn't put that crudely in wartime. It is dressed into speeches about patriotism, love of country, and we must all put our shoulder to the wheel. But the profits jump and leap and skyrocket and are safely pocketed. Let's just take a few examples. Take our friend, the DuPonts. 
to powder people. Didn't one of them testify before a Senate committee recently that their powder won the war or something? How did they do in the war? They were a patriotic corporation. Well, the average earnings of the DuPonts for the period 1910 to 1914 was six million dollars a year. It wasn't much, but the DuPonts managed to get along on it. Now let's look at their average yearly profit during the war years, 1914 to 1918. 58 million dollars a year profit. 58 million dollars a year profit. Nearly 10 times that of normal times and the profits of normal times were pretty good. An increase in profits of more than 950 percent. Take one of our little steel companies that so patriotically shunted aside the making of rails and girders and bridges to manufacture war materials. Well, their 1910 to 1914 yearly earnings averaged $6 million. Then came the war, and like loyal citizens, Bethlehem Steel promptly turned to munitions making. Did their profits jump, or did they let Uncle Sam in for a bargain? Well, their 1914 to 1918 average was $49 million a year. Or let's take United States Steel. The normal earnings during the five-year period prior to the war were $105 million a year. Not bad. Then along came the war and up went the profits. The average yearly profit for the period 1914 to 1918 was $240 million. Not bad. There you have some of the steel and powder earnings. Let's look at something else. A little copper, perhaps. That always does well in war times. Anaconda, for instance. Average yearly earnings during the pre-war years, 1910 to 1914, $10 million. During the war years, 1914 to 1918, profits leap to $34 million a year. And remember, even 1910, $10 million is a lot more money than it is now, and it's a lot of money now. I'd be happy if my business made $10 million a year now. That was a lot of money. <clears throat> or Utah Copper, average of $5 million per year during the 1910 and 1914 period, jumped to average of $21 million yearly profits for the war period. Let's group these five with three smaller companies. The total yearly average profits of the pre-war period 1910 to 1914 were $137,480,000. Along, then along came the war. The yearly average profits for this group skyrocketed from 137 million dollars 137 million 480,000 to 408 million 300,000 a little increase in profits of approximately 200 percent does war pay it paid them but they aren't the only ones there are still others Let's take leather. For the three-year period before the war, the total profits of Central Leather Company were $3,500,000. That was approximately $1,167,000 a year. Well, in 1916, Central Leather returned a profit of $15.5 million, a small increase of 1,100%. That's all. The General Chemical Company averaged a profit for the three years before the war of a little over $800,000 a year. Then came the war and the profits jumped to $12 million, a leap of 1,400%. International Nickel Company, and you can't have a war without nickel, 
showed an increase in profits from a mere average of $4 million a year to $73,500,000 yearly. Not bad. An increase of more than 1,700%. American Sugar Refining Company averaged $200,000 a year for the three years before the war. In 1916, a profit of $6 million was recorded. Listen to, state, to Senate document number 259. The 65th Congress reporting on corporate earnings and government revenues. Considering the profits of 122 meat packers, 153 cotton manufacturers, 299 garment makers, 49 steel plants, and 340 coal producers during the war. Profits under 25% were exceptional. For instance, the coal companies made between 100% and 7,856% on their capital stock during the war. The Chicago Packers doubled and tripled their earnings. And let us not forget the bankers who financed the Great War. If anyone had the cream of the profits, it was the bankers. Being partnerships rather than incorporated organizations, they do not have the have to report to stockholders, and their profits were as secret as they were immense. How the bankers made their millions and their billions, I do not know, because those little secrets never become public, even before a Senate investigatory body. But here's how some of the other patriotic industrialists and speculators chiseled their way into war profits. Take the shoe people. They like war. It brings business with abnormal profits. They made huge profits on sales abroad to our allies. Perhaps, like the munitions manufacturers and armament makers, they also sold to the enemy. For a dollar is a dollar, whether it comes from Germany or from France, and they did well by Uncle Sam too. For instance, they sold Uncle Sam 35 million pairs of hobnailed service shoes. There were 4 million soldiers, 8 pairs and more to a soldier. My regiment during the war had only a pair to a soldier. Some of these shoes probably are still in existence. They were good shoes. But when the war was over, Uncle Sam had a matter of 25 million pairs left over. Bought and paid for. Profits recorded and pocketed. There was still lots of leather left, so the leather people sold your Uncle Sam hundreds of thousands of McClellan saddles for this cavalry. But there wasn't any American cavalry overseas. Somebody had to get rid of this leather, however. Somebody had to make a profit on it. So we had a lot of those McClellan saddles, and we probably have those yet. Also, somebody had a lot of mosquito netting. They sold your Uncle Sam 20 million mosquito nets for the use of the soldiers overseas. I suppose the boys were expected to put it over them as they tried to sleep in the muddy trenches, one hand scratching cooties on their backs and the others making passes at scurrying rats. Well, not one of these mosquito nets ever got to France. Anyhow, these thoughtful manufacturers wanted to make sure that no soldier would be without his mosquito net. So, 40 million additional yards of mosquito netting were sold to Uncle Sam. These were pretty good profits in mosquito netting in war days, even if there were no mosquitoes in France. I suppose if the war had lasted just a little longer... The enterprising mosquito netting manufacturers would have sold your Uncle Sam a couple of cons consignments of mosquitoes to plant in France so that more mosquito netting would be in order. Airplane and engine manufacturers felt they too should get their just profits out of this war. Why not? Everybody else was. So, 
a billion dollars, count them if you live long enough, was spent by Uncle Sam in building airplanes and airplane engines that never left the ground. Not one plane or motor out of the billion dollars worth ordered ever got into a battle in France. Just the same, the manufacturers made their little profit of 30, 100, or perhaps 300 percent. Undershirts for soldiers cost 14 cents to make, and Uncle Sam paid 30 cents to 40 cents each for them. A nice little profit for the undershirt manufacturer. And the stocking manufacturers, and the uniform manufacturers, and the cap manufacturers, and the steel helmet manufacturers all got theirs. Why, even when the war was over, some four million sets of equipment, knapsacks and the things that go to fill them, crammed warehouses on this side. Now they are being scrapped because the regulations have changed the contents. But the manufacturers collected their wartime profits on them and they will do it all over again the next time. There were lots of brilliant ideas for profit making during the war. One very versatile patriot sold Uncle Sam 12 dozen 48 inch wrenches. Oh, they were very nice wrenches. The only trouble was that there was only one nut ever made that was large enough for those wrenches. That is the one that holds the turbines at Niagara Falls. Well, after Uncle Sam had bought them and the manufacturer had pocketed the profit, the wrenches were put on freight cars and shunted all around the United States in an effort to find a use for them. When the armistice was signed, it was indeed a sad blow to the wrench manufacturer. He was just about to make some nuts to fit the wrenches. Then he planned to sell these too to your Uncle Sam. Still another had the brilliant idea that colonels shouldn't ride in automobiles, nor should they even ride horseback. One had probably seen a picture of Andy Jackson riding on a buckboard. Well, some 6,000 buckboards were sold to Uncle Sam for the use of colonels. <laughs> uh oh, Not one of them was used, but the buckboard manufacturer got his profit. The shipbuilders felt they should come in on some of it. They built a lot of ships that made a lot of profit. More than three billion dollars worth. Some to the ships were all right. But 635 million dollars worth of them were made of wood and wouldn't float. The seams opened up and they sank. But we paid for them, and somebody pocketed the profits. <laughs> it has been estimated by statisticians and economists and researchers that the war cost your Uncle Sam $52 billion. Of this sum, $39 billion was expended in the actual war period. This expenditure yielded... 16 billion dollars in profits. That is how the 21,000 billionaires and millionaires got that way. This 16 billion dollars in profits is not to be sneezed at. It is quite a tidy sum and it went to a very few. The Senate, nigh, in parentheses, NYE, the Senate. Nye, Committee Probe of the Munitions Industry and its Wartime Profits, despite its sensational disclosures, hardly has scratched the surface. Even so, it has had some effect. The State Department has been studying for some time methods of keeping out of war. Excuse me. The War Department suddenly decides it has a wonderful plan to spring. The administration names a committee with the War and Navy Departments ably represented under the chairmanship of a Wall Street speculator 
to limit profits in wartime. To what extent isn't suggested? Hmm. Possibly the profits of 300 and 600 and 1600 percent of those who turned blood into gold in the World War would be limited to some smaller figure. Apparently, however, the plan does not call for any limitation of losses. That is, the losses of those who fight the war. As far as I have been able to ascertain, there is nothing in the scheme to limit a soldier to the loss of but one eye or one arm, or to limit his wounds to one or two or three, or to limit the loss of life. There is nothing in this scheme, apparently, that says not more than 12% of a regiment shall be wounded in battle, or that not more than 7% in a division should be killed. Of course, the committee cannot be bothered with such trifling matters. I'd like to thank you for joining me. Pretty interesting stuff. Hope we'll see you in the next episode. Go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed the episode.